Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 6 of The Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry Podcast with me, Philip Heidson, and Dara McAnthony, Chairman and Co-Owner of Peterborough United. Before we, we jump into everything from this weekend, I do just want to mention that voting for the Football Content Awards is now open. Uh, we're in the Best Podcast Football League category, so if you do have the chance, head on over to footballcontentawards.com slash voting, scroll down to our category, type in The Hard Truth, you know what to do. We'd uh, really appreciate the votes. Um, all right, so we've had a pretty adventurous week, I think, with uh, uh, both the uh, the League Cup and uh, the games on Saturday. Where do we start? I guess let's start with Saturday. So, well, we start with your comments to me just off air. Yeah. Um, so you just said to me you watched the posh game. Um, you tend to watch a lot of our games with Patrick. And I think, obviously, I, I can't comment on a referee or officials, but your comments to me just now were that's the worst referee you've seen in 17 years. Yeah. Um, your comments to me where it was the most outrageous performance by an official uh, with a big home crowd. And I don't know anything about him. You said to me, apparently he's left Scotland and he had that reputation and he's come to England. Um, oh, yeah. And you, you had him at the start of the season, but I, I don't want to dig a referee. I'm going off your comments about the decisions he made on Saturday, including couldn't wait to obviously send off one of our players, mm. according to you. Um and obviously, yeah, it's frustrating because I can't actually make any comments uh, you, because I'll get, I'll get in trouble. trouble. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. You can make all those comments and call them crap and, and a home referee and buckled under pressure and constantly booked our players, even though they had more fouls than us in the first half. We ended up with, I think it was four yellow cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you said it needed like GBH by a Derby player to end up for one of their players to get yellow carded. It's funny, we were talking about this all off mic before we just came and hit the record button because um, the referee, uh, a guy called Bobby Madden, was somebody we had first day of the season when we played Doncaster. And so mm. you might remember from the um, mm. uh, from the podcast the first week, we had um, one of our players basically broke his leg in two places. Yeah. He'd got a yellow card. Uh, Lee Tomlin got himself sent off for a bit of theatrics. Right. But, you know, you came in and thinking, this referee is just coming down from Scotland. He's mm. got the pedigree. He's, he's ref obviously some of the biggest games in European football. Mm. Um, and I was sorely disappointed. And so it's funny, on Twitter the week before when I saw he was refing your games, I said to the Swanee about the fact he'd probably ra rather have Richard Madley than Bobby Madden as your referee this week. Your comment's not mine. All I can <laughs> say is we, we, had, we, we, we had a phenomenal referee last week. It was her yeah. first game. And um, she was phenomenal. And, uh, you know, it was just right down the middle on all the decisions. And um, I can't comment as to what happened on Saturday. Look, here's the, here's the reality. Here's the hard truth. I said this in my video yesterday about my thoughts on the game. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a great contest. You know, we should have been 2 0 up in five minutes. But Jack Marriott's had two wonderful opportunities. Um, they've come into the game, as you would expect, in front of 30,000 home fans um, and had their own chances. And it's kind of even Stevens. The one thing you've got to do when you go to places like Derby, if you're going to win, if you're going to go to Sheffield Wednesday, to Derby, these people, you're not going to, nine times out of ten, you're never going to win with ten men. You, you have to keep your discipline. You have to keep your shape. You have to keep everything, your emotions in check. So you got, you know, and, and again, I'm going to say what I'd say to my own players. Jack Taylor kicks the ball away. That's a yellow I agree with because there's no need for him to do it. So our best midfielders put themselves under pressure with that referee and what's going on. Straight off the bat. Nathan Thompson, very experienced player, and he'll be on, on the phone to me when he hears the podcast because he think I'm having a go again because I did it last year because he's, he's over two years ago and we won promotion. So maybe it's superstitious me having a go. He'll ring me and we win promotion. But again, you don't give a referee who's obviously you're watching the game and thinking, geez, you know, we're getting a lot of yellows. They're not getting any. So the last thing your players do in the second half, the ones who are on yellows, they have to watch the step and they cannot give the opposition even a sniff to get them sent off. And unfortunately, we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And that's where I talk about ill discipline. And we put ourselves down to 10 men. And a magnificent effort by the 10 lads. We got 1-0 up. And they are, they're off their feet with, with minutes to go. They score in the 89th minute and then again in the 92nd minute. And that's heartbreaking for the 10 men because it's the 10 men I want to talk about who put their heart and soul into trying to get a result for the couple of thousand fans we had. Um, again, a nothing game. Um, you know, a game where chances wise we had some good chances but we didn't work the goalie but we did create some good chances i mean we created enough chances to win the game or just our shooting boots weren't there on you know jack marriott last year i think had nine goals and 20 shots you know see so, so he needs to get the rust out of his boots this year because he could have had five last week he could have had two yesterday 
that'll come. That's not a problem. And look, of course, Derby are going to be up there. Of course, it's, you know, and uh, and some of our fans, some people will be saying, yeah, but away from home, you're not good. Plymouth, the, Plymouth was an anomaly. To get it. Performance wasn't there. We put a shift in yesterday. We deserved something out of the game. We beat Cheltenham away. Stevenage, you want to go off the cup game. You know, we score a perfectly good goal. The linesman is 40 yards behind it. It's onside. Clark Harris puts his 1-0 up with seven minutes to go. It's game over. But again, a decision. So we spoke about VAR. Mm-hmm. I love VAR. And the reason I love VAR is because that yellow card doesn't happen this day. You know, yeah. well, I don't think it does. I don't know if you can go and check for a die on a second yellow. I don't know if it's a red or a yellow. But the offside goal against Steven stays on as a goal. You know, little things like that don't go against you. And that's where I suppose Nigel Pearson was getting emotional at Bristol because he was getting emotional after games he'd won. Right. But, you know, when this goes against you, these are managers whose jobs are on the line. And those little things that go against you are massive. They're massive in the grand content, you know, scheme of things. They are just massive. And and if Bobby, whatever his name is, has come down from Scotland because he wants a route to the Premier League, fair play. All refs want to see that chance of promotion and whatever else. I'm sure his paymasters, the assessors, they'll watch the game and I'm sure they'll have an opinion. I think his words to our manager after the game where his linesman gave the second yellow, even though he was 40 yards away or whatever he was. So, you know, did the player cheat to get Nathan Thompson sent off? I'm not going to comment on that. Everyone does it. My players do it. Every player do it. So there's no criticism for me for that. And there's no sour grapes here. Derby won the game, scored two goals. We scored one. We didn't take our chances. We were real disciplined at times. On another day, we win the game. So it was a good battle. Um, I think some of the Derby fans were a bit irritated with some of the comments from our local press and da da da. And by the way, again, because Alan Swan had thrown out headlines last week about the recruitment or lack of recruitment of a player, the manager's number one target. And, you know, again, it's it, a lot of the headlines he leads with kind of like they create problems. Yeah. And it's like, I wish you had something else to write about or come up with your own stories, Alan, because you don't need to go down that route. And I need you to be very careful how you take my quotes out of context and headline them because there are someone getting pissed off with and he needs to like relax on that. So again, don't take anything I've said today and put it out there or I end up with an FA ban because I have not criticized the referee. That is you. You can yes. blame me. <laughs> yeah, you have made all those comments about the referee, yeah. um, so, so, so which you're allowed to do as a fan. Um, but yeah, frustrating day, frustrating Tuesday. You know, a lot of things the last seven days are frustrating because, you know, whilst we weren't at our best against Stevenage, we were defensively very strong against a physical team. Yet yeah, Stevenage made eight changes. We made nine changes. We had a young goalie make his debut. He was tremendous. We had young players who weren't at their best. The following day, they're getting slaughtered. What frustrated me was the week before, they're heroes against Plymouth. A week later, they're villains at 19 years of age. And what I was trying to say in my message after the Stevens loss was, focus on the experienced players who started the game. You know, you, you, you had Frankie, you had Josh, you had players like that, and even Jack Taylor played a half. You had very experienced players, when I say experienced, who played a lot of games for Peterborough. But a lot of our fans' ear, irritation is that you're Ricky J. Jones and you're Joe Taylors and players like that. Like, please, back the fuck off. Leave them alone. Like, you're having a pop at a 19-year-old who has been around too long and not making an impact, according to some. It's fucking ludicrous. Particularly when said 19-year-old, the last 10 games in the championship was rinsing teams like QPR. Man City had to change their centre-backs at half time because of their pace. Swansea ripping them apart do you know what i mean like you, you know creating goals in the championship forest very unlucky not to beat forest and again mm-hmm. said player destroyed them with pace this is a 19 year old we're talking about ricky yeah. who has never been fit the last three years has had you know uh, a testicle issue three years ago ankle ligament damages last year he's never started for the season with a full pre-season has always had to come in late he's growing and sometimes players who are growing could be accused of being made of glass then they get the 20 onwards. They're fine. Steven Jared was similar when he was younger. Had a lot of growing pains. So this is a player with tremendous potential, as is Joe Taylor. And they're one of our own. And you have to just like back off and stop with the, well, let's send them out on loan. We have seven subs this year. These players are getting first-class coaching every day. They're playing in EFL trophy games. They're playing in league games. They're getting substitute appearances. You know, this is invaluable for them. If they stay with us, we win a promotion. Again, it's invaluable. Like two years ago when Ronnie was with us and he was in and out, but we won a promotion. He used that then as a platform to go and play 30, 40 games in the championship the following year. 
that's the way we're doing it. We're not going to change it. And those players, the, you know, the manager and the staff rate them, as does the football club. So everyone needs to just tranquilo. You know, and I got in the, a couple of arguments with a few players. It's it, no good. No, don't throw out those kind of accusations against young teenagers who've got tremendous amount of ability. I, I'd hate to say, I'd hate to see what the Spurs fans were saying about Harry Kane when he was on loan at Lake Norris, you know, or whatever else, or when he first came on the scene. And I suppose people say, yeah, but he was out on loan. Yeah, but he's gone from the Premier League down to really, like, by all means, we're talking about League One. Our youngsters should be able to get some time at this level. So that's the way we're going. So really frustrating week because, you know, Stevenage loss, last second winner. Derby loss, last second winner. Fine margins. But like I said, sometimes you get a lot of growing pains early on. And that is the way it is. So I got a couple of things to ask you. One uh-huh. is just just on the uh, like on Ricky J Jones and the kids uh, against Stevenage. Is there sometimes unrealistic expectations placed on those players? Do you think that's what's no. driving some of no. that? No, I, 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 those players should be good enough to beat Stevenage. Mm-hmm. So they just had a bad night. Nineteen year olds have bad nights. Um, you know, Harrison two years ago when he was eighteen and we won promotion was in and out of the League One side and he'd have great days and he'd have bad days. Teenagers can and young players can be inconsistent. That's just normal. I can show you a lot of young players in, in the Premier League and the Championship who are in and out, and they're just, they can be inconsistent. Sometimes, like against Plymouth, both Ricky and Joe Taylor, fantastic, both scored, really good. Seven days later, not as good. So that just happens. You know yourself. Any team that produces young players, a lot of it's built on, whether it's Crew or Exeter, because I mentioned those as great clubs that do that. It's based on a lot of patience, a lot of support, you know, a lot of no finger pointing. And all I'll say is, you know, the senior players have to take the finger pointing when they lose to Stevens in the League Cup because there was millions of pounds worth of senior players on the pitch. So I would always say they're the ones who should take the, the you know, the shellacking that comes afterwards, not a young player. And I, you know, yeah, uh, you know, and, and look, our young players are strong. They have to be strong because, you, you, you know, it's tough sometimes. And, it's actually not usually the older crowd. It's a lot of the younger fans who can get carried away with some of it. But then again, there is that generation thing where I've, I've swatted a few young Peter United fans away recently. I don't know what it is with these 17, 18, 19 year olds. I've said it before, but parents need to do their jobs better. Because the disrespect coming from some of those, you know what I mean? Like um, shit stains that have come at me with stuff. Like, who the fuck are you? Do you know what I mean? Like, again, my son's 17. The idea he would speak to someone like that. You can see where these fuckers are going in their life, mm-hmm. you know, with that kind of attitude. So young. So a little bit of frustration, but you know what? Great experience. Um, and again, on Tuesday, we're playing Stevens in the EFL Trophy, and these young players are getting another chance. Whether they're shit, whether they're good, tranquilo. Yeah. So have you, uh, so on the first thing in the morning, the day after, was Steve Evans on the phone or on the texts too? No. You didn't no. hear from him? No, I didn't hear from Steve. He knows me too well. <laughs> that, you know, if he sent me a message the day after, he's like, the fuck off. So no doubt I'll hear from him next week. Right. Um, he's, once he's got the two games out of the way, then he can... Yeah, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But listen, Steve, you know, fucking Steve cost us the league title two years ago by beating us at our place. Yeah. You know, he, that's what he does. It's, it's. Am I shocked Steve and beat us? No. We've never done fucking great there for some reason. Whether it's an FA Cups, whether it's mm-hmm. in League Cups, it's one of them plays. Look, fair play for them. And I hope to make a fortune out of the League Cup. I like the people behind the scenes. So is what it is. And good luck to Steve. Yeah. I see they, they lost one beaten one on Saturday. So... He'll be good. He won't be worrying about Peter, but he'll be furious about that. So, as is football. Look, we've had a shit few days. Now, something going back to the Derby game um, mm. is performance as, as important as results at this stage, or is, is it always results first? Because it sounds like, um, you know, you were relatively satisfied with the performance, especially with 10 men. And I think they did well, you know, from what I saw. You know, can you take the, the benefits and the positives from that? I, I, I'd like us to be a little bit more confident in our ability to go to a derby and win. Mm-hmm. I'd like our players to be a little bit more swaggery in the fact that, hey, you know, we're good at home. We should be good away. And we're, we're good enough to beat any team in this league. And what the manager definitely got was fight. He definitely got, you know, a lot of hard yards put in. What we didn't have was the skill side. You know, for a team like us, usually, to have, I don't know, probably 15 shots off target where we skied and bombed things. H alone had three chances. You know, a lot of our midfielders arrived in areas where they could have scored. Um, Jack Marriott had two in the first five minutes that any other day he, he scores both with his eyes shut. Clark Harris, the same. So it's one of them days you take the defeat. The performance wasn't bad. It was a 50-50 game. It wasn't like Plymouth where we were just look fucked. 
Mm-hmm. And you could tell we'd had a bad few days training. We didn't show up. Plymouth completely deserved to annihilate us, whereas Derby was different. So nine times out of ten, we played the way we played on Saturday. We were winning, I'd say, over 70% of those games. So it is what it is. You move on. You know, the manager I was gutted for, spoke to him. You know, to lose in that manner and after the, the circumstances, I, I think he was... But by Sunday, he's, he's one of them that's out of his system. He's fine. We're talking about this, that, whatever. And, you know, it's an experience you learn. Can't do it too many times. If you want to win promotion, you want to win a league title, you have to go to places like that and win and take points. So I'm going to come back to VAR when I talk about Bradford, actually. But uh, okay. I want to move on just a little bit. So you signed Efron Mason-Clark. Um, well, according and- to some... I'm the one who signed him, not the manager. <laughs> and again, I nearly jumped. There's like one guy. I haven't heard that. Const- There's one guy who constantly digs me out. He's got real being as bond of a young fan. Uh, I, I'm not sure, you know, what's happened. Do you know what I mean? What what the issue is? Because he's salty as fuck. In any given chance, he's just like bang, bang, bang. And he's one of them straight away. This isn't a Grant McCann sign in. Another winger. No. Last Monday morning, it was either Monday or Tuesday morning, I got an email off the manager. And the manager had said, just had a big meeting with all my staff. You know, we'd had four or five targets we were going over the last couple of weeks since Sammy left. And it goes back to June in Dubai. The manager called me in Dubai and said, I've had an agent on um, who I trust, the boy at Barna, did it. And I'm like, I named him straight away because we yeah. looked at him when we took Jack Taylor. Yeah. And I said to the manager, my opinion at the time was, he's, he's, got, he's been at Barna too long, stale. I'm not sure. So we went away from it. We played Barna. He obviously destroyed us. Both our goals came from his and, side. And you mentioned it in the pod. You I said, did. We needed uh, uh, that I'd have walked away yeah. with him. Uh, and the gaffer said to me afterwards, again, look, that's the boy. I was right. Da, da, da. Anyway, so this email last week, the manager, and I've got the email. It's in my Dropbox. So this little fan, this little you know, shithead, if he wants to go in with the, the head of Pisa and actually take a look at the email, I'll allow them for five minutes to read it. Just to, again, prove a point. The email is along the lines of chairman, analyzed everything, looked at everything, actually don't want to attend. We've got Kwame, you know, he's one of our most important young players. He's going to be sensational. He's going to play 10 with Ben Thompson, potentially Randall, but it's going to be Thompson and, and Paku if we do play this formation. I want um, the boy Efron from mm-hmm. Barnard. Um, he can play as a nine. He can play left. He can play right. They've played him up front this season. He's got a couple of goals. Um, love everything about him. Done a lot of research into his character. Uh, I was nearly going to name the other club. Another club, I actually thought he was sold three weeks ago. Yeah. Another club at the top of League One uh, was, was close to a greener deal. Yeah. So I actually thought it was gone, hence why I hadn't revisited it. And Grant was basically like, that's the one I want. So I went back and said, okay, you and Baz have been going on about him for like two and a half months. I'll trust your judgment. Um, you know, maybe the boy does need to step up. Um, he's at that age. He has been a partner too long. And he has looked sensational this season, to be fair. Uh, a lot more conceived. There's no doubt he can play at our level technically mm-hmm. at, all day long. So I got on to Barry and said, look, make the deal happen. This is the one the manager wants. Um, we'd obviously circle the wagon on a couple of other options. We've made some big bids for 10s. We'd spoke to a Premier League club about a 10. The manager had come up with it as an option, but obviously they only wanted to loan him. We were going to do that as a backup plan near deadline day. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, mm-hmm. Alan Swan framed it that I wasn't signing the manager's number one target. So again, it sets off the natives that I'm not giving the manager what he wants. Um, but this was the one the manager wanted. So no word of a lie. Um, I think the boy, Jack Taylor, loves him. He, he couldn't give him a strong enough recommendation. He's got a lot of upside. Mm-hmm. So no brainer. We did the deal. We beat, obviously, this other club then came back to the party and tried to gazump us, even though the boy was in the hotel with us the night before mm-hmm. and had come to the Stevenage game as Barry's guest because me and Baz had to deal with the agents at the Stevenage game. Some of the press were looking down. I could see the player probably thinking, who the fuck's that? So that's the story behind the signing. There's no conspiracy. There's no, this is a Darren McAnthony signing, trust me. It's not. I fully back the manager. I trust his judgment. And that was how it was done. Yeah. You know, when um, when I came into your office to do the pod and Barry was there, Barry then was speaking his praises. And that was what, like you say, three See, weeks ago. When right. He, there, he was on his way. I, I said to Baz at the time, well, he's gone, he's gone. But you heard him at the time. Barry and Grant. I've been yeah. waxing lyrical about this boy since I was on my holiday around the 10th of June. Yeah. So, you know, anyone who wants to call me out that it's my signing, um, I- I'm going to have you because I've got all the evidence to the contrary and I'm sick of arguing. I-, I-, I don't. I feel at the moment, maybe I'm feeling sorry for myself because I've been away from home so long. I'm finally going home after a quick business trip to Dubai this week. 
I'm just, I'm fed up with the shit coming my way. Mm. I'm the guy here carrying the load. I'm the guy here working. I'm the only one. Yeah, no one else, me. And everyone's just hammering me with crap, particularly the trolls. And if only they knew, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, fucking, you know, they, they have no idea. So yeah. trust me, they're fucking lucky they have me right now, Philip. <laughs> you know, it's, um, you're on hiding to nothing sometimes. I mean, obviously I see some of what goes on behind the scenes yeah. and, uh, um, yeah, you, there's things that you don't see as a supporter that have been right. eye opening for me seeing, you know, what it is that you're up to and what you're having to put up with on a weekly basis to, uh, correct. You know, to move things forward. Correct. Correct. If, forward. If, 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 if people knew the challenges just yeah. the last seven days alone, I've had to face and deal with and, and crap and stuff and fires I've put out when I, seriously, I've just given my all. Like I, there was, there was one stream of comments from some little shit stain uh, and I shouldn't let, usually I don't let this shit wind me up. It's probably because I'm feeling sensitive because I've been away so long and I need to get home. But along the lines of, um, where's the two and a half million from Schmodox? Oh, McAntony's Ted, the estate agent. That's what they like to call me, yeah? Jealous little runs. Has taken the money as usual and da 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 I'm the guy who hasn't taken money out of the football club for over a decade. Yeah? Not a fucking pound note. It's, it's in, when I see stuff like that, I actually want to get my lawyer on these people because it's, it, it goes against my character. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's just, it's horrible to read shit like that. And two and a half million, don't believe everything you read. This is a situation where I'd love to go past the undisclosed on a deal and show somebody ins and outs of a deal. It was a three year deal. We still owed Bristol City 500 grand, the original transfer. Guess what? That then becomes all fully payable when you sell a player. You don't continue in the schedule payments, yeah? And then you're waiting time for deals. That's There is no two and a half million. There is no big windfall. Don't forget. Yeah, it doesn't miraculously show up in your bank account. But yeah, don't forget. We got a five plus million pound hole. I'm here alone trying to plug. Yeah. You know, so again, like get off my back here. I'm trying to do my best for everyone involved. I've got no agenda. My only agenda is making us a competitive team to win promotion, to pay all our bills, to do things correctly, which I've always done. And I've been proud for 17 years, and I'll continue to be proud mm -hmm. that we've always managed to do that as a football club while I've been here. So people just need to go, boom, back up. Now we've got, what, as we record this, three or four days left in the transfer window. Any ins or outs that you're expecting between now and what is it september the second this time around september the first we've 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 had we've had uh two firm bids for young ronald you know and again you know this stuff's again leaking and breaking like, you know first one was on thursday night then the second one was on friday and then by sunday night it's out there uh and it's not his agents because his agents are really good so i don't know who's leaking this shit um and those who like have a go and whatever about my valuations and Peterborough, and why are we saying this is why we're always in good shape. This is why contrary to reports, you know, about our imminent demise and about us carrying this debt and doing whatever else. I always make sure we've got playing squad full of assets. And yes, we've, I've turned down uh, to uh, bids that would be so far the highest we've ever received an initial transfer fee in my time at the club. And I've sold quite a few players for some big money. So if anything happened there, we would get a centre-half in. And it would be a left-sided centre-half for balance. Because right now, probably lacking a little bit of balance. So, you know, all our centre-halves are very good, but they're all right-footed. So if young Ronald went and the clubs that are trying to buy him won't probably give him back to us, uh, I'll probably have to get a left-sided centre-half. So I'm heading down to the club tomorrow, Tuesday. I'm there at nine. I'm there all day on a 16 hour day. Every hour I'm meeting different, I'm meeting head of academy, I'm meeting head of finance, I'm meeting head of ticketing. I'm sitting down with the Posh Plus guys, I'm sitting down with press. I've got a two hour meeting with the manager, the staff, meeting the other 23s. I'm going through a whole day, because obviously this week I'm heading off, and I'm going through stuff with Baz and the manager. If, if, and if happens, what will happen? You know, what we're going to do, how we're going to react. Yeah. Yeah, carry a plan. So, so, um, I don't, I don't, I don't envisage it happening, but you just never know. Um, and again, you know, before everyone gets excited, you know, anything that comes in is going into the football club, you know, for, for everything to do with our budget. So that's quite normal before people think I'm ordering a new Ferrari or, you know, buying a helicopter or whatever else. So just, you know, another rumor I've seen about Ivan Tony, I'm waiting for the Ivan Tony sell on. 
to come in to head off into the sunset at the end of the season. It, it doesn't work like that, people. Mm. A, the sell on, even if he went to the 50 million, we're not talking about seven, eight, nine, ten million in Peter was coffers. There's a 30% sell on to Newcastle on that. There is a percentage of what, you know, what we've already been paid. Yes, it's a few million, but you're not talking about life changing numbers where I'd be like, sayonara, I'll take what's owed to me and I'll head it off. It doesn't work like that. So some of the crap I read. It's just baffling sometimes. Do you know what I mean? And, and frankly, like from a valuation of the club perspective, those things, those are assets that sell on and the percentage is an asset of the club. And so that's already taken into account in the valuation that you would get if you're going to sell the club anyway. Correct. So, and that's that's really- why I always I always say our squad is worth many, many, many yeah. millions. Whenever we've had an offer or whenever someone has ever approached the club, you know, this is why we are valued differently to most clubs because I can show you this summer alone eight figure in total over eight figures in cumulative bids mm-hmm. for three four players do, do, do you know what i mean so so that's where we as a club always have assets and that's what we do and we won't stop doing that so i made bids for a number 10 one of the bids was uh, over 800 grand mm-hmm. so you know people be like oh, they're spending money well we always spend money you, you know the boy from barnett's six figures he wasn't you know uh, dropping the ocean oh. We've talked about your philosophy. If you spend fees, you you try not to spend wages. Correct. So you'll, you'll do the outlay in a fee, and then you'll try and correct competitive wages. I, 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 I was trying to get very exciting young talent in the, in the league, and trying to do fair play to their club. Said no to all the offers, and I stopped it. I was eight hundred grand over time and whatever else. And then we spent money elsewhere. So you, you and yes, it's always over time. But we did try, and in the end, it, it didn't go anywhere. Um, fair play. Clubs can say no. But don't ever say that you don't have money <laughs> when you say no. So, so you know, that's who we are. And that was before we were starting to sell Ronnie or anyone else because I'm always trying to make things work. That's what we do as a club. It frustrates some people, our policy, but it's what makes us tick. You know, I, 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 I see Sunderland do the same now. You know, a lot of people take our policy. You know, people were complaining that Alex Neil left because 20 of the 25 players they signed were under 24. wonder where they got that policy from because they've realized the sustainable football club is run correctly and fair play to the Sunderland owners. They're doing things right, like Brentford did beforehand, like other clubs. That's that's what we do. Because what you don't want to be in a position is where you can't afford to pay your bills. And that's where clubs can get carried away. And too, many, and, and, too many clubs have been down that road now that they've got the scars to show it and they're making sure they don't do it again. Correct. Correct. You want a football club the right way. Mm-hmm. And I've always said, I think we do that at Peterborough. And that might irritate our fans at times and sign 10 grand a week players and sign loads of experienced players and da 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 Give the manager what he wants and do this and do that and whatever else. Well, that's fucking great. When he gets plucked by a bigger club and we're left with whatever, you know, there has to be a way the club operates. So is what it is. So look, frustrating for Peterborough. Bradford, I think, what a day. They lost on Tuesday. They had a point on Saturday. So yeah, we talk lost, me through the week. Lost to Black, uh, Blackburn on Tuesday, 2-1. Um, I didn't get to watch it just because of the rights. Uh, you can't. I couldn't get it over here, so I listened to it. But by all accounts, we made a good show of ourselves. You know, a relatively strong Blackburn side. Uh, we went one nil up and just couldn't kind of hold on to it. But you know, it's one of those where you walk away and think we gave it a good show. Listen, you got to get your home form together, right? Because that was at home yeah, on Saturday. It's another one that you know we drew nil nil at home to Crew on Saturday. Mm. Um, you know, everyone is going to come and try and shut up shop, and we haven't found a way of breaking it down yet. And, um, you know, probably the main reason about that is we're just not fast enough on the break, and we're not, we're too, you know, labored and deliberate, and there's no surprise. Pace. Yeah. So there's no like explosiveness when you go forward. It's passing it around, you know, keeping in triangles, you know, patience, which is great, but, um, it's you know you're, you're a lot more solid but you're not as dynamic as you like yeah you're relying you like on like you know a pinpoint cross or something like that to find you know exactly the man rather than finding gaps and um you know running um running at the defenders so until that changes it's going to be tough to break down some of these teams that just come to defend solid enough start it's a good mm-hmm. platform yeah yeah so, i'm not so. there's nothing that um I'm happy with where we are. Of course, you'd like to win every game. You'd want to have some more points on the board and everything, but there's no like, oh crap, you know, we're in for a bad season feelings or anything. Who, who, who do you want to sign before the window closes? We need a winger. We need. Right. We need some. I don't know who the right person is, but we need somebody who can get the ball, who can, uh, you know, drive at the uh, um, at the fullbacks or go through the whatever it is that just brings some pace to the attack. And we had two of those. You know, we had. 
uh, Abel Iso and um, 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 the lad that got Osadebi, who got crocked in the first game. Both of those injured, um, so we don't really have anybody who can do that at the moment. No. So, I mean... Are they doing any business? Well, I think we're still waiting on Dion Pereira to see if that happens. You know, we've waited for him all window, and Luton were talking about him wanting to go, or them wanting to send him to League One. I don't think they've had any takers. So, uh, you know, as we come down to the final couple of days, those rumors are, are rearing their head again. So, okay. Um, I've got a few, you know, I think that we need a little bit of something that's a bit of a spark. Um, and we'll see, I guess, whether we pull anything off. We got young Scott Banks from Crystal Palace, who looks like a steal. He looks, he's a really good winger, who great, you know, on the ball, creates space for himself. You know, he's already doing really well on one side, but we just need something to balance that out a little bit. Okay. Yeah, um, and so what I wanted to say about VAR that I kind of put a pin in earlier was, um, you know, last minute we had, could have probably had two penalties in the same passage of play. Um, I saw, I saw. And, you know, you just look and think, I've always been a little bit against VAR. And the standard of refereeing, I know we talked about it right at the beginning, the standard of refereeing just seems generally to have gone down another level when you think that's not even possible this year, where you just look at all the mistakes and think, you know, we'd have had a penalty with VAR without a doubt and would we have scored that penalty i don't know but you know it's costing consistently costing points we 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 i uh, i think I, i'm tired of seeing the top leagues get things that we don't get for a long time afterwards you know goal line technology VAR. i think you know when these things are brought in it should be a financial thing across all our leagues we're part of a pyramid for god's sake like you know premier league pay for it for us you know, it, you know, EFL, do a deal, get it done. You know, I think we we need VAR. You know, you see some of the decisions up and down the country in the Champ League 1, League 2. You know, we, we need this to happen. It needs to happen. Uh, and it's going to bring excitement to our leagues as well. So I don't know why we don't make it happen. But it needs to happen. It, it feels like it's inevitable. I just wish they'd hurry up because the ref... Correct. And to try and... I, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of the referees and empathize with the referees. I mean... We change the we tinker with the rules so much. I mean, back in the day, and now you know it feels like I'm old saying these things. But you know, the rules <laughs> wouldn't change from one season to the next, and maybe yeah. there'd be one change every ten years. Yeah, um, yeah. it seems like every summer there's another ten different interpretations or tinkering mm -hmm. or things like that. That it's really just hard to keep up with what actually happens. It, it, it is. And by the way, I watched the first two episodes of the uh, Welcome to Wrexham. Oh yeah, how Did was you that? Them? No, I've got it uh, teed up. We uh, haven't watched it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was fun to watch. Um, the two guys come across well, uh, Reynolds and McElhenney. Um, you know, I, I my old uh, player, Dean Keats, he obviously it's covering that season where he lost his job. They didn't make the, the playoffs and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's during COVID. You know, it's raw. You, you know, I like it. I like it. It's a good show. Um, by God, the difference from these first two episodes to where they are now with players, the wages, the manager, the stuff I know what they spend, I've heard. Um, massive difference. So it must be nice to have a two-season deal with one of the biggest networks in America to help you fund all that. Um, you know, Netflix are listening. You know, I'm, I'm open. <laughs> you, want some, you want some proper old old-fashioned uh, crack on camera, you know, me and Baz. We're open. We're bad. ready for a sequel. Mass We're ready. The camera again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I'm ready for a sequel. So, but it must be nice, you know, because, you know, they're talking about the first two episodes are oh, the risk and what happens, you know, if they need to sell and the money they're putting in. But the reality is it's monopoly money if you're getting a lot of it funded by, by network TV and sponsors. Yeah, and you've just sold your gin company for God knows how many, uh, you know, hundreds of millions. Hey, I don't, I don't, I'm not jealous of that. I'm, I'm always healthy envy. Yeah. Fair play to the man. He's a good looking bastard. He's a great actor. My son loves the superhero movies. He now owns a bit of football club he's trying to take up. I love the story, the way they explain the pyramid to Americans. And it, it, it's fun. Watch it, watch it, because we can discuss it next time. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But no, it's uh, it was really good. I mean, I, I'm seeing today, like, you know, Amazon and Netflix are fighting to pay millions to pay Man United for one. You know, obviously, you've got all or nothing. I think Arsenal, I read today, they got 10 million for their series. And I really enjoyed that. And look at how well Arsenal are doing. So, you know, to get a Man United or to get some, you know, this is the way of the world. These documentaries are now a big part of it. I feel like you've got to do something a bit different, though, than like just following another Premier League team for another season seems a bit same. Oh, like, 100%. 100%. I mean, if Amazon and Netflix were clever, 
they would take a club from each. Like you have in America, the NFL is called Hard Knocks. And every year, per their TV contract, one club has to have the whole of preseason and then in season another club. And I think uh, Amazon, Apple, uh, um, Netflix, any of these who are do, looking at all these should go, you know what? Let's do a deal with the EFL. Let's pay a big amount of money. And every year we'll do a League Two, League One champ club. And every year flip it to a different club. And that's just part of the deal we all sign up for. And it's a bit of extra money for everyone. So, yeah. you know, yeah, why not do it? Storylines and some of those stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's entertaining. Time. Yeah, it's entertaining, you know. Yeah. So definitely do it. I've watched all of them on Amazon now. The Man City one, Tottenham one I didn't enjoy. The Arsenal one I really enjoyed. You know what I mean? I've, I've seen the Sunderland till you die. I've seen Leeds do their own one. Palace did quite a good one I watched last year mm-hmm. about their rise up to the Premier League. But that was kind of self-made. Um, Rex, my now doing theirs. Yeah, really, really good. It's always different. So what else we got? What else we got? We've got to go around the leagues. Yeah, so, you know, uh, despite the uh, the challenges you had at Derby at the weekend, you're on, what, ninth heaven from both a Celtic perspective and a Liverpool perspective this weekend. That that was that was mad, yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember being 13 when I saw Liverpool win 9 at Palace. Like, I saw, the, obviously, the highlights and shit back then, but John Aldridge was, like, my hero striker back then. Um, but, yeah, Liverpool obviously dismantled Bournemouth. Celtic obviously look Celtic on a different level at the moment, but Liverpool it was. Uh, I'm still concerned. I, I, I'm not overly happy, you know, where we are with the window about to close. Um, if they sign a player, I'll be happy. Yes, we've got some good young talent. Yes, we we destroyed, you know, Bournemouth and whatever else. And and yeah, you're watching Scott Parker, and you know, has he been left short? 100, percent he has. But you, you you know, that's obviously the owner there has decided he doesn't want to do what they did in the past. So. They're going to struggle this year. Watch Newcastle Wolves. It was a good game yesterday. Forest Spurs. Sp- Forest were, were okay for a couple of knickers a lot of the time. You know, control the game. Typical Tottenham counter attacking now under Conte. Um, I think there's a lot more to come from Forest. They're obviously juggling so many players um, in there. And I think they've just signed their 19th and 20th players today. So they're, they're still on the, on the charge. Um, I still think they're going to be very comfortable in the league. Palace two up and Man City come straight back and you know yeah uh, every time I see every time I see someone go two or three up at Man City I think you just awaken the beast yeah so you know they're unstoppable with Haaland as well so um, but Palace are a really good team they're going to win a lot of games this year um, Leicester I feel for Brendan Rodgers he's obviously mm-hmm. going through the mill you know they're playing a 10 men uh, Chelsea Vardy's missed chances he wouldn't normally miss they hit the bar twice they should have won that game judging by the highlights um, Stevie Gerrard's under pressure I see at the yeah. Villa yeah. I think it's a little bit too early I think a lot of the Grealish money was spent on players prior to him arriving under Dean Smith mm-hmm. and I think Gerrard's probably spent I don't know 60-70 million you know if you saw what he did at Rangers it took him three transfer windows to turn him into title winners I think their fans need to be get behind him as do the owners it's all very quiet there there's a lot of stuff in the press today about his start they've obviously got I think Arsenal, Man City next. Mm-hmm. So he's under the cosh. Um, Liverpool still concern me. But yes, that was a good start. Let's see how they get on at Newcastle on Wednesday because that's the acid test at Anfield. Yeah, if they beat Newcastle, yeah. I think Newcastle are a different proposition. If they beat Newcastle on Wednesday, they're back in business. If they struggle again, then I'm still worried. And another mention for Brighton, just carrying off, carrying on where they left off. Phenomenal. Last year. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Comfortable, a club that is... is is maturing, that's comfortable within itself in the Premier League, has got no danger of relegation, is now looking upwards to, to progress on last year's improvements. Proper Premier League club, well run, no debts, great profit from transfers, players from all over the world at their scouting departments, obviously phenomenal at what they do. And um, yeah, just such a well run club. I don't think Graham Potter is going to be there in two years' time. I'd be amazed if he was neither the next England manager yeah. or the next Spurs manager. Do you think they? Would... I don't see, I uh, you know, Conte last two three years of clubs. Do you think that they built the structure that they would survive that, or that he is pivotal to? Everything? I I think so because if you look at the way they recruit managers, it's a style of play. You know, uh, if Russell Martin doesn't get the bullet and gets his act together at, at Swansea, he'd probably be that type of manager they'd go after. And mm-hmm. um, you know, Steve Cooper came from that school of thought when when he left. I think Swansea Cooper went in there, but before obviously. Um, Potter went to uh, uh, Brighton. Uh, where was he before? Well, before, I want to say, who was the previous manager at Brighton? I'm trying to rack my brains. Yeah. 
Um, was it Chris Hewton? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm just quickly looking Captain up. Captain of the Premier League? Uh, <laughs> I think it was Chris Hewton. Yeah. But the bottom line is that they're a very well-run club. Um, if they did lose Potter, um, I think they'd be the type of club that would be okay. I just think they're so well put together. They lost Dan Ashworth this summer, business as usual. You know, so uh, I, that's a credit to the owner. I think, you know, Tony Bloom is probably one of the best British owners of the football club in England. And and 10 points for Chris Hewton, because that's who it was. Yeah, it's a big difference with Graham Potter. Yeah. But if you watch the way they play, the only thing you'd ever criticise about Brighton is, if they had, and these are a premium, a 20 goal a season striker, they'd probably be vying for the Champions League. Mm-hmm. Which is incredible. Because <laughs> they create, if you look at all the data and the stats in the last three years, the chances they create and miss so they had, let's say Brighton bought Ivan Tony. Let's say they went hell for leather and spent that money that they, that they got for the Chelsea before they went to Chelsea. Spent 60 million, made an offer Brentford couldn't turn down. I'm not sure Tony would go there. He'd probably, you know, thinking, well, the difference, whatever else. They'd probably turn into a top, top six, like, favorite, you know, because, yeah, but then again, you'd look at style of play. But then again, I look at Ivan Tony and go, he's the type of player that can play in all styles. You know, it's gone under the radar how much people don't talk about him in this window. And you see United spending 90 million quid on a guy who's got a goal every five games from Holland. It's ludicrous. It's fucking ludicrous. So what what do you put Ivan Tony's chances of getting a call up for the World Cup? Because I see I think, more chatter now about that again. Yeah, well, absolutely. And he wouldn't look out of place. I think Callum Wilson's obviously, his hamstrings are always in question. You don't want to lose a player during a World Cup. He could go at any time in a game. Um, I think he's miles better than the, the, the kid at Aston Villa um, that was previously at Brentford. Um, he offers something, yeah, Watkins. He offers something completely different. He's physical. Um, I think he's better than Tammy Abrahams. Um, I think it gives England an outlet, a plan B. Um, you got Sterling and Kane, and then you got Tony late in games. He defends both boxes. You look at England in previous championships, conceding later in injury time. Ivan Tony's one of them that can defend your box. Both boxes. So I think he's a shoe in. Uh, I'd be amazed. I haven't got an England cap. Four posh fans get excited. There is no money on England caps. No. So you can criticize me for that there. I got I got for everything else, but that's the one thing I didn't get. Yeah, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? Correct. So yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. So um, go through the go through yeah, the Yeah, well in the championship I wanna talk about the manager Merry Go Round to start with and Alex Jeez. Neal leaving Sunderland, which to the you know uneducated like me seemed like a bit of a shock um, to go to Stoke, but obviously either there's something that he's not happy with at Sunderland, or there's something he's been. No, I, I I I don't I don't think it's that he's unhappy. Of course, he's probably not buying into the young and hungry policy. He's not that type of manager, but he got on with it and he's done a great job. I honestly think Phil, if someone offers you three times what you're on right now, I think you'd leave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think managers are human beings. I spoke to Grant McCann about this yesterday. You know, it's a short career. It's an average lifespan of 11 months. You know, a lot of managers are end up commentating. They haven't got the money people think they do after tax and everything else. Yeah. And I think if an opportunity where a club that's an hour from your previous home in Preston comes along, as opposed to staying in hotels in the Northeast, and is offering you three times the money, and I'm guessing here, by the way, I know Stoke's owned by a very wealthy family. Um, I, I think Sunderland gave him a new deal tried to keep them. There was no way they were going to pay that kind of money, considering they just come up. Right. If they get relegated again, I had a problem to have a manager and match that kind of... They've done the right thing. Some of them have got to move on. And it's run by good people now. And I think they'll move on. I think Tony Mowbray is going to go in there. Tony's, you know, even though he's an older manager, he's very good at young players, mm-hmm. a la Blackburn. And I think he'll do all right there, Tom. Does it change your estimation of where Sunderland can finish this year? Because no. you know, you've talked no. about that. I, I think they recruited really well. I think they've got two strikers that will, will give them a chance. And I think when you have that in the championship, fully fit, like if we'd had Marriott and Clark Harris fully fit last summer, all the way through, we'd have finished 15th, 14th mm-hmm. in the champ. Um, and that's no word of a lie. And I think they've got two very competent strikers. Ellis Sims has got injury issues in the past. Keep him fit um, with a boy Stewart. Don't sell him. And I think they've got a wonderful opportunity of being top 10. And I think Mowbray will come in. He will work really well within the, the parameters if he does get the job. And I think it's an easy fix. The one thing they can't do is wait two weeks. They have to make – they've got to move quickly. Yeah. Now, as you would expect, everyone's pretty bunched up in the table after only six games. But I do want to just mention Reading. Um, yep. You know, obviously had a, a tough season last year and 
Um, yeah, Inti's working miracles already. Yeah. Ask me again after 15 games. Yeah. Sometimes you get it. Clubs are like Southampton were top of the Premier League two years ago. I just think sometimes, yeah, I still think the shakeout's going to be your usual suspects. I watch Luton obviously take Sheffield United to the max the other night in a really mm-hmm. good TV game. I still think Sheffield United are going to be up there. Probably still lacking a 20 goal a season centre forward. Um, Rotherham, special mention to them on beating yeah. again. Yeah. Uh, again, comfortable at the weekend. Um, I think they're playing Sunderland during the week. So that's going to be really interesting. This is Rotherham's best start, I, I want to say, to championship life for a long time. Um, fair play to Tony. And uh, I hope they uh, I hope they do really well and continue to do well. Yeah, and QPR got a good 3-2 win away at Watford as well. <laughs> really good game. Saw the highlights for that. You know, Watford, I feel for the manager there, he'd be on a sticky wicket. If they don't, yeah. if they have a few more bad results, the way the owners there are, you just never know. Um, you know, they need to either sell the, all the forwards that have been linked with different clubs and get on with it or tell everyone it's not happening. It's probably a lot of stuff at the moment's uncertainty. You know, I know from the fact that our players will have heard what Sammy's on at Blackburn. Mm-hmm. Our players, some of them will be thinking, I should be in the championship. And there'll be some of that a hangover from the champ. And I'm not having a go at my players. I was speaking to my gaffer about this yesterday. They're human beings. We forget sometimes. So when I always say you're not going to see our best football for a while, some of the thinking in me saying that is maybe some of our better players in their heads are thinking they want to be in the championship. Yeah. I'm not saying they want to leave. I'm not saying they're causing problems. But maybe mentally they settle down when the window closes. Maybe mentally they know they're here for a fixed period of time. They get on with it and get down to business. Sometimes that's great when the window shuts. You can kind of like just go, right, it's now we're going down this route. Forget all the speculation. We've now got our squad. There's no more unsettlements. There's no more headlines. There's no mm-hmm. more nonsense. There's no more shite in the podcast from the owner. Yeah, I'm joking. Um, blah, blah, blah. There's no more Alan Swan. You know, great headlines from this podcast trying to, again, like upset the apple cart. Thought I'd have that dig against money. So maybe come the window closes, you see a lot of clubs settle down. And there's a lot of that going on. Now, going over into League One, um, you know, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank can't buy a win at the moment. He gets a first minute. Very unlucky. First minute goal, uh, Burton away at Cambridge. And then 10th minute, you get a man sent off and you, you're still pretty close. I mean, it was 4-3 they lost in the end. Um, I, I, I kind of felt for them as I was seeing that. I, I did. I saw that. And Cambridge United, obviously, down the road from us. So, um, yeah, it's, it's League One this weekend. What was good? Um, MK Don seemed to be struck gold. Mm-hmm. Uh, Portsmouth had a really good win. Um, showing again it's not easy to go to places like that and win um, Sheffield Wednesday obviously battered Forest Green yeah. uh, Ipswich got pegged back by Barnsley who are starting to get better um, you know again it's, it's you know Derby obviously nicked the game off us late on it's just one of them leagues it's, it's going to be a fascinating league for a lot of people watching from the outside this year yeah there's um, uh, what else did we have Oxford uh, finally there was a lot of red cards I mean I know we talked about you know, <laughs> there was a lot of red cards all across the league <laughs> um, Oxford got um, a late one with 10 men and then Cheltenham had another one sent off in uh, injury time uh, Fleetwood got a late equaliser at Lincoln uh, yep. to like a 2-0 uh, head start and uh, Plymouth keep you know doing the business 2-0 very good at home Plymouth very yeah. good at home so, uh, like I said to you, so many good teams in League One. Um, and then, obviously, in League Two, we go on to do a quick thing in League Two. I think uh, Salford got a good result against Stevenage. Uh, yeah. Peter Wh- 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 is that his name at Barrow? The guy who keeps doing really well as a Barrow? Um, um, the guy you nearly hired? Yeah, it? Pete Wilde. It's Barrow. Pete Wilde. Yeah. I mean, again, like the job he's doing, he won't be hanging around long in League Two if he continues. Um, who else in League we Two? Got, um, so, Leighton Orient continued. Um, yeah, really, really good team. Really good team. Um, yeah, so League Two, the shakeout. I mean, again, you see tables, you see whatever else. It's just so early. It's so early. You know what I mean? Like, you know, any team puts together. Reading could lose four games in a row and you go from hero to zero. Um, anyone at the bottom of any league can win five in a row and suddenly they're in second place in the league. It's just that is the beauty about this early in the season, isn't it? Yeah, the one team that I think have surprised me in terms of their slow start is Gillingham. So Gillingham are... Uh, you know, four points from the first six games. Mm. Uh, and I just thought that they would, with Neil Harris in charge, would um, mm. uh, probably adapt a little bit better than they have done. But again, early days. Early days. So couldn't call any. So have we got any Q&As to quickly get through yeah, before we, we a, sign off? Let's see. We had a couple of questions that came in. We have one from Joseph. Joseph says, I'm an avid listener from the Republic of Ireland. 
Uh, look forward to every new episode each week. And he would love to get Dara's thoughts on current Fleetwood owner's takeover of Waterford. Um, he yeah, the energy business must be doing well right? for a good old Andy. You know, yeah. <laughs> so I think he's in the energy business. So I think he's buying clubs for fun at the moment, isn't he? South Africa, Dubai there. Fair play to him. Look, I like Andy. I got offered that deal a few months ago. Um, just with my current situation, whatever else, I'd love to buy a club in Ireland. It was, the timing wasn't right with my attention currently on posh and stuff. I'd like to, I've always said I'd like to add a portfolio of clubs. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I tried to, um, based on promises, you know, put together deals to buy five or six clubs, but the money never materialized to do it. I always felt like the policies I have, the way I operate a football club, if we did it across a group of five or six clubs in lower leagues, I think we could have a hell of a football group. Um, so, yeah, Ireland's always been of interest to me, as were other areas of Europe, a la, I was looking at Belgium, Holland, France, uh, Portugal, Spain, Denmark. You know, I actively gone and got potential deals ready, done a lot of work on it, and we're ready to like launch this group of clubs. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know what Andy's doing in South Africa and Dubai, place like that. Wouldn't be my area of interest. Also, I looked at the States as well, the USL, but Ireland's definitely of interest. So, good luck to him and good luck to the club he's taken over. A wonderful place. I've family from that neck of the woods, and I think they had a big 6 0 win on his, his opening weekend. So, uh, yeah, good guy. I like him. And, uh, you know, happy for him that the energy sector is doing so well. <laughs> um, and our last question is from Dennis. Dennis uh, asks, if it's harder to attract players in the high, from the higher league to go down a league or two permanently, you know, it is. So it how is. do you go about doing that? It is. We, we spoke to a player from the Prem and his agent, and it was like, we'll come on loan, you know, and, and if you do well, maybe we'll come to you again in the champ. But that player's got no chance of ever breaking into his club in the Prem. So there's a lot of arrogance, like we're doing you a favor. And contrary to everyone going, yeah, did I pull the deal? My manager is the ultimate decision on that. And then my manager was like, do you know what? I, I, with the option to buy, I want to do it. With the loan, unless it's a backup plan for deadline day. And that's why we walked away. Um, but, you know, you do find that at times. We had another player who was at Leicester. But again, the player had a year left, was refusing to come on a permanence, wanted to do a loan shine brightly and then go on a, at the end of the season pick whatever club and didn't really suit us so fair play players know what they want that's up to them and their agents and um, i can't admonish them for that it's a short career you know that's the way you want to go not a problem for me we move on um you, you know when you when you there's no perfect science to signing players you know the boy from barnard and um, i i wanted to make sure we had an option of a fourth year the agents didn't you know i fought in that i won in the end um, you know, I understand why they didn't want that option, but I don't want us caught short like we did in previous transfer sales where we entered the final year. It's always, you know, when you pay money for a player, I like to do four-year deals. And if it's not a four-year deal, it's a three plus one option or a three plus two. So that has to be the way. And um, again, on that one, I, I dug my heels in because we're spending money. And in the end, we won. So not won, but, you know, we, we everyone yeah. did okay. You got the deal you want. Got a deal we want, you know, fair play for the ages. You know what I mean? They were they were they were good people to deal with and whatever else, and they deal with a lot of bigger players. So that's it. That's it in a nutshell. All right. Well, uh, thanks again. And you you keep breaking the cardinal sin with my superstition. You keep emailing me on a Saturday, good luck before a game. What have I fucking told you? Don't do it. I tell my wife the same. Don't do it. Hey, do it no Saturday again. Before the Derby game, I read your fucking email. I was like, you how many times have I said it to people? Don't text me, don't message me. Before a game on a Saturday, leave me the fuck alone. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> I was, love you to bits. It was stop. There was no good luck. It was only when you responded. It's like, oh, he's alive. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know that. But you said it in the next response. <laughs> Fingers crossed. You did that, which my missus used to do. And I used to think I'd go crazy. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> right, I'm going to wish you Not bad forget. luck if I ever get in that situation. Don't say anything. <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> Nothing. So oh, push hands, it was my fault on uh, It was Saturday. your fault, you fucker. And you jinxed your own teams. You didn't win. So this is like, yeah. this is like a football fan. Anyway, listen, guys, again, get on that uh, awards thing. It's for the staff who run all the podcasts. It's for them. It's a good night out. I want them to win. You know, yes, you listen. It's brilliant. We've got the viewers. Phil, tell them where to go to vote. I want you all to vote. I voted. Phil's voted. Who else? Yeah, it's footballcontentawards.com slash voting. Go, do, go down to the best podcast football league category. Um, just pop in hard truth that's all you need to do 
That's it. Get it done, people. Have a great week, fuckers. All right. See you next week.